is Dr. Justine Chinuperikwe. Dr. Justine is an OD scholar practitioner, corporate governance expert, an author, educator, and serves as a director of academics and programs at the Center for Organization, Leadership, and Development, CODE. Dr. Justine is also the managing director, the managing editor, I'm sorry, of the organization, leadership and development quarterly academic director and visiting faculty in the United Arab Emirates. He is also a peer reviewer of the organization development journal, ODJ. Dr. Justine is a director of programs for the Chartered Institute of Leadership and Governance, that is SILG. Dr. Justine is the author of four good books focusing on organization development, corporate governance, in banking, decision making for transformational presence, and exceptionality without relapse. So you know that today we are going to have a great session with Dr. Justine. So I welcome you, Dr. Justine, on behalf of all of us, and I'm sure we are going to have a great time. Dr. Justine is from Zimbabwe, but currently working at the Emirates. We welcome you, Dr. Justine, this morning, and I wish you all the best in your delivery. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Genevieve. Welcome, Doc. For, for that introduction, and thank you so much, uh, Silk, for, for the opportunity to, to share in uh, this particular seminar. And I'm going to be discussing the issue of uh, fostering strategic change through organization development. And organization development is uh, a field that is close to my heart and that I believe leads to sustainable transformation in individuals, families, organizations, and the entire society. So the discussion this uh, afternoon or morning, wherever you are, focuses on strategic change, something that is exciting to hear, something that is presented in a number of conferences and seminars, yet if we look at it from an African point of view, we don't see much of strategic change. So I welcome everyone to this uh, Leading Transformation, Innovation and Strategic Change seminar and in the next 45 minutes i will be facilitating this conversation from uh, the perspective of zimbabwe and madam genevieve has introduced me in the context of the egoistic titles that we get in the journey of life but more importantly to to myself as an individual and in the context of leadership i am a husband to to grace and the Lord blessed us with two kids, Ryan and Roland. And the whole essence of uh, my engagement is centered on that relationship. And the practical application of leadership and principles of OD into families. I have seen a lot of people in leadership with titles. I've seen a lot of people who seem to have achieved it in leadership and governance relapsing or toppling over when it comes to families. I've seen a lot of leaders feel comfortable posting pictures of them sitting in the first class. I've seen them posting pictures of them in hotels, but they forget about where they come from. So I'm going to talk of leadership, which is practical, and not leadership that we focus is more on when we do motivational speaking or when we're in hotels and conferences but leadership that cuts across all levels of life. I am a father to many. We have uh, kids that we support in Zimbabwe and Grace, my wife, is involved in that in initiative. And we have this educational support scheme that is centered on ensuring we get the message of leadership to the grassroots, to the underprivileged, to the marginalized. So Grace is involved in leadership conversations with these underprivileged youths who do not have the opportunity to sit on a Zoom platform like we are doing today, who are excluded in our hotel presentations 
seminars, which we mainly target those who have a certain social standing. So I am a father of many in terms of the educational support scheme and the actual application of practice to the ground level or at grassroots level. So we are going to talk of strategic change from the perspective of where we are and where we want to be as individuals, as families, and as organizations. And yesterday, a question was posed regarding how we can orient future leaders and ensure that we build leaders for future generations. And the question that I will pose this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are, is how are we going to orient leadership if we exclude the marginalized, the underprivileged, and organize conferences, seminars, high-powered seminars, only for people who have a certain social standing in society. So our application of leadership, our application of governance from a SILG perspective, should take a consideration of the underprivileged, the marginalized, the youths that we see more often on social media discussing issues that are irrelevant to socioeconomic transformation. And that's the leadership that I believe Africa needs and Africa should endeavor to embrace going forward. I don't have much people who wear pencil striped suits. I don't have much people who wear expensive ties, red ties and shiny shoes to say they have been uh, my mentors. I don't have much much of those people that most of the youth today want to associate with and say, I am close to these people, the government ministers, and all that stuff. The grounding of my leadership comes from my grandmother, my mother, my father, and my wife. And this is the leadership that I'm going to be discussing to you right now. Though I have lecturers who I have come across, I have people that I have did rub shoulders with, the grounding of leadership that is transformational, the grounding of leadership that brings value to societies and to individuals comes from the grassroots. We have done conferences in Africa. I think we have more conferences on leadership and governance than ever before. But the leadership, the more we talk of leadership and governance, the more we see socioeconomic decay. And I'm going to take us through a leadership journey that considers going back to the grassroots. A lot of people, when they are asked, who is your inspiration? They want to talk about these guys with pencil striped suits, red ties, shiny shoes, because we have been made to believe that they are important. But this morning, I want to remind you that your parents, those who are in your villages, are more important to leadership than these people we consider to be of high social standing. They have failed society. They have failed organizations in spite of them being dressed in these red ties, tiny shoes, and pencil striped suits. We see a lot of decay in Africa, yet we have these people we so much look up to and the youths so much look up to, to the extent that most of our African youths forget about where they came from. But leadership, if we are going to talk of leadership that is transformational, no matter what organization you work in, should be grounded to the grassroots level. And we need that to be the philosophy of those who pursue to lead, to lead leadership in Africa those who look forward to real transformative leadership in Africa, those who want to lead organizations that produce value in Africa should be grounded in our Africanness, should be grounded in respecting the values and beliefs of us as Africans. I am in Abu Dhabi, I should be showing you the, the Burj Khalifa, I should be showing you the Porsche cars that are here in Abu Dhabi, but it's of no value. But our leadership today places emphasis on money, power, and possessions, and ignoring socioeconomic issues that are fundamental to the transformation of the African continent. And the subject today is about strategic change 
through organization development. And what is strategic change? Dr. Shagun spoke about change management yesterday. And Professor Nana spoke about creativity yesterday. And these are things that we have had over and over again. And most of our leaders seem to appreciate these particular concepts, but nothing of value is happening on the ground. Africa is lagging behind. African organizations are lagging behind. Employees in Africa suffer more than any, anyone else in the world. We have employees who work for certain leaders. Five years, employees are working in the same department, same job, same responsibilities, and they have leaders with them. And the question that was posed yesterday by Dr. Na Professor Nana is, are the leaders in your organization exploiting the creative potential of the teams they lead? In most instances, if you go to organizations in an African context, people are not realizing their full potential. People are locked in cubicles for one year, doing the same job, nine to five, doing the same routine. And most of the people who lead these employees go around preaching leadership. We see in organizations, leaders wear pencil stripe suits, Leaders wear expensive wristwatches. Leaders wear expensive shades and they do spray expensive perfumes. But the employees that are under them are suffering. And they call themselves leaders. So we need to rewrite the story of leadership. We need to reconsider the story of leadership and see what exactly do we mean when we say we are leaders in organizations. And history is filled with the skeletons of once glory day companies that have deteriorated. Companies that we thought were adding value to our societies, but they are nowhere to be found. Yesterday, Dr. Shagun said 40% of companies will not be opening after COVID-19. What happened to these companies? What do most firms do right, the successful firms? What are some, why are some countries and organizations thriving at a time others are in crisis? Why do some people enjoy growth in their careers while others are stuck in certain cubicles? My submission to you this morning or this afternoon is that we have a leadership crisis in organizations, in families, and at national levels. We have abnormal people assuming leadership positions. We have abnormal people. <laughs> Mr. Abdullahi Abdurasak, can you please uh, mute yourself? We have abnormal people running companies, people who are self-centered, people who have no heart for employees, people who are only focused on achieving organizational goals at the expense of the employee. These I'm submitting are abnormal people. And when we continue to be under the leadership of abnormal people at family level, at organizational level, at society level, no matter how many models of leadership we are going to produce, Africa and African organizations will continue to be in the same state that we are in today. So strategic change is about improving performance. Strategic change is about enhancing individual development. And what we want to see in organizations, what we want to see in society is continuous improvement, is enhanced individual development. And what do we mean by continuous improvement? Everyone, every leader in organizations know about continuous improvement. Leaders in organizations know about enhancing individual development but they have employees under them who have been working for them for the past five years and they are only surviving from hand to mouth. Yet the same leaders fly first class. The same leaders are building mansions. The same leaders are sending their kids out of Africa for study. And their employees are struggling to pay fees for $15 a term. 
And we have termed these people leaders in organizations. We have people who are working in cubicles and have been stuck at the same role for the past three years. And someone is enjoying a position of a manager managing such people. Someone comes to work, post pictures on social media to say, I am a team leader in my organization. Team leader of employees who are stuck in a cubicle for the past five years. I'm a team leader of zombies. And that is celebrated in our organization. These same managers get service awards at the end of the year. And the employees are doing nothing. People have creative potential and our organizations are at the center of destroying that creative potential. If we want our organizations to thrive, it's high time those who take managerial roles, those who take leadership roles, understand the essence of leadership and what is at the heart of leadership. It's high time that in Africa, we celebrate motivational speakers coming into training halls and saying we are doing leadership development. It's high time academic institutions take charge of issues of leadership development and executive coaching rather than the thriving learning and development industry that is contaminated with motivational speakers who have no grounding about leadership, who have no grounding about governance. It's high time organizations like the Chartered Institute of Leadership and Governance be given the pride of space in discussing issues of leadership and governance rather than someone who has been unemployed for five years and is trying to survive and they call themselves leadership experts and we pride them and bring them into our organizations to train. It's high time the issue of executive coaching and leadership be given pride of space and people who have demonstrated practical leadership be given pride of space in our African countries and organizations. It's high time we celebrate these self-named leadership experts in our organization. We need normal people. We need high value teams. We need high value organizations and it's not something that can be achieved if we run away from strategic change mindsets. And I believe if in our organizations, if in our societies, if in our nations, we start focusing on continuous improvement, if we start focusing on enhancing individual development, our societies and organizations will thrive. It's high time we focus on the cultivation of capacity and efficiency with no value. It's high time we see people with titles of bankers, nurses, and scientists, engineers, yet in actual fact, they have nothing to demonstrate about these titles. We need to move away from celebrating mediocrity. We need to move away from celebrating the cultivation of capacity and efficiency with no value and start seeing leaders who understand the essence of leadership and what is at the heart of governance and what does it mean to be a leader and not just taking positions, power and possessions and start calling ourselves leaders in organizations. So the pride of place should be given to institutions, to individuals who have demonstrated leadership and do away with motivational speaking in our training halls, in organizations. How do we drive strategic change? We are in an environment that demands productivity. And we see most of our leaders are trying to take control, tightening control and asking employees to do more in less time. And this has been more pronounced during the period of COVID-19 when certain companies starting laying off and very few people are expected to drive productivity in less time. We see employers pay little attention to their employees' development and satisfaction. I have been working for the past 14 years. I have not found companies that pride in sending their employees for, for employee development. Companies resist or are hesitant to support employees who want to develop themselves. 
the mindset of the leaders that we have in organizations take pride in going out for cocktail parties rather than paying someone $80 a month to take a course for personal development. We need responsiveness to highest level of knowledge. We have organizations that are taking pride in research. We need to give them the pride of place in our organizations. We need to encourage creativity and innovation, and this was discussed by Professor Nana yesterday. We need to see science taking charge in Africa and real science, not just science that we see scholars publishing articles that are substandard, just for the namesake. We need to enlarge social sympathies, and this was touched by Dr. Museka during the first day of the seminar when he was mentioning issues of empathy and sympathy. There is no social empathy in our leaders. Our leaders are so prideful that they enjoy putting on a $500, $1,000 shoe when their employees are working, are putting on a $20 shoe which they have been wearing for the past five months. And they pride in that. There is no sympathy, no social sympathy in our leaders. Self-centeredness, greedy are the characteristics that we see in leaders. And Professor Nana yesterday said, everyone is a leader. So when I say leader, I mean you and me. We need to reflect on ourselves when we say we are leaders and see, are we leading in any way? We are in most instances accustomed to blaming political leaders, yet we don't have time to reflect on ourselves and our leadership at individual level. We need a leadership that prides in inquiry, engagement, and responsible leadership. And we need to give organizations such as SILG that are promoting leadership and governance of value, the pride of place, and not promote motivational speakers in organizations. They have failed organizations in Africa to date. A lot of the leadership, those who call themselves leadership experts, have failed organizations in Africa. So we need responsiveness to highest levels of knowledge. We need to encourage creativity and innovation. We need the enlargement of social sympathies. And this was mentioned in 1980 by Ali Mazrui, the Kenyan academic. And our leaders know that, but it has not been applied anywhere. And here is what uh, MJ Wheatley said. He said, one thing I have felt deeply with uh, indigenous communities in Africa and Australia and North America is that the lure of acquiring material goods is stronger than any other lure in the world now. African indigenous people have priority of, of materialistic items. They prioritize material goods than anything else. African leaders want to be seen in these pencil striped suits driving big cars and living in big mansions. This is where their focus is. And the issue of value is nowhere to be found. We see ourselves once you become a CEO, you want to travel to Dubai, you want to go to Canada, you want to be in France and posting pictures. This is the mindset of our leaders in organizations. And this has led us nowhere. This has led most people to have a lifetime of poverty in Africa. This has led people to have a lifetime of being a clerk in organizations. And we need strategic change in our organization. Things have to change if we are to move forward as a people. The greatest challenges that we face today in the world, we have issues of inequality, climate change, depletion of natural resources, wars and rising nationalism. These are some of the key issues that we are facing everywhere across Africa and across the globe. Our leaders pay no attention to that. Our organizations, though they devise some sustainability plans, their sustainability plans on paper without actual implementation of those sustainability plans. We have CSR policies in organizations, but it's CSR policies that are just put on paper in order to meet certain regulatory requirements and to appeal to, to the market. And in actual fact, there is nothing happening. 
if our organizations were serious about social responsibility, no kid would not be going to school today in Africa. An average government school in Africa costs $15 per term. That's $45 per year. But we have kids who are not going to, to school in Africa. And we have a lot of indigenous families with CSR policies. We have poverty next to our organizations. We have beggars next to our organizations. And our leaders pay no attention to those issues because their eyes are focused on driving profit. And how do you drive that profit by milking the ordinary man? And these are the characteristics of things that we see in organizations in our societies. And there is need for strategic change. Strategic change demands leaders who continuously engage with and are galvanized by the big questions of the day. If you look at the CEOs in most of our organizations, they do not engage with, neither are they galvanized by the big questions of the day. They are focused on fulfilling the shareholder wealth maximization, which has failed organizations in Africa to date, as we see more poverty in our societies. We see employees struggling in our organizations, and we go in knowing there is need for strategic change and change that embraces, change that is holistic, change that values human beings, change that prioritizes development from a perspective of full arc of development in our organizations. And this will move us forward. These are communities in Africa. These are images that we see every day in Africa. This is what is happening in our communities, in our societies. And the question is, where are the leaders? Where are the leaders to solve these particular issues? Where are the leaders of organizations to attend with the CSR policies and address these issues? Where are the leaders? Where are those leadership experts who go around posting on social media that we are doing leadership development and training? Where are they? when society is in shambles. We call for leadership development trainings and we go into five-star hotels, yet issues are on the ground. Where are the leaders? Where is leadership? Where is governance? So we are saying we need to start giving the pride of place to people, normal people in leadership. When we are appointing CEOs in our organizations, the boards and the shareholders need to start giving the pride of place to people who understand leadership. We need to change our societies and it needs strategic change. So helping others and making the world a better place is exactly what leadership, governance and strategic change is about. Leadership is not about position. Those of you who read John Mark, who follow John Maxwell, it's not about position. I don't know who told Africans that if you are a CEO, if you are a leader, you need to put on expensive suits and expensive ties and wear perf expensive perfumes better than everyone else in your organization. So much such that when you go to an elevator and the CEO is there, the, elevate, the whole elevator is given to the CEO and nobody else enters that elevator. Yet society is in shambles. We have confederation of industries in different countries. We have CEO roundtables in different countries. And when the CEO roundtable sits, they don't discuss these images. They discuss profit, return on investments, luring investors. These are the issues that we discuss. But leadership cuts across the different levels of society. So strategic change is unattainable when leadership is in crisis and we have a leadership crisis. And leadership crisis is a situation where we have leaders who have no concern about their followers, leaders who have no concern about society, leaders who are only focused on themselves. And this has thrived in our organizations, in our society because of deviance normalization, celebration of mediocrity and fetishization of irrelevance. 
There are certain things in our societies that we have normalized. There are certain things that we celebrate, yet in actual fact, it's of no value. There are certain things that we give pride of place, yet it's irrelevant. We have awards that organizations are giving in most circles of society, which awards are of no value. And society is in shambles. We sit in hotels. We normalize deviance. Things that should not be done is now acceptable in organizations, in societies. We celebrate mediocrity. Employee of the Year Award, Organization of the Year Award. And we see all these things on social media. What Organization of the Year Award, what have they done? What Employee of the Year Award, what have they done? What value have they added in organizations? We fetishize re irrelevance in our organizations so much such that we go year in, year out, and no growth is happening in our organizations. We have leaders who are full of greed, leaders who are self centered, leaders who are prideful, egoistic, leaders who are arrogant. We have leaders who are oppressive, open to lies, and are focused on power positions and possessions. And this is what the classical description of ourselves as leaders. And we have normalized that deviance. It's now accepted. There is a way to cover up and society accepts. You post it on social media, you get more social media likes. Today we are discussing leadership and governance here and we are only 40. If you go on a social media post of nude pictures in Africa, Everyone is there and they are putting comments. And the question was posed by His Royal Highness yesterday about orienting future leaders. Are they in a position to be oriented when all they follow is social media posts that are irrelevant? And when you ask them to come for a CIOG conference on leadership and governance, they don't attend. But they are posting pictures of irrelevant issues on social media. We have normalized deviance in our organizations. And we see a lot of domestic violence. We see a lot of extramarital affairs by our leaders. We see a lot of corruption, environmental degradation, poverty, and fear of change in our organizations. And it has been normalized. And going into the biblical scripture, the book of Isaiah 1 verse 23 says, your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves. They all love, love bribes and chase after gifts. These are the description of the rulers that we have. They do not defend the fatherless. And the leaders are you and me. We are rebels. We are partners with thieves. We love bribes and we chase after gifts. We do not defend the fatherless. And if you reflect on yourself, there is a tendency for you to justify what you are doing. And this is what I am referring to as deviance normalization. You are rebel in your own way, but you will not accept it. We justify. We are partners with thieves, but there is a way that we justify these things. There are certain contracts and certain documents that we sign to normalize this deviance. We take bribes and we chase after gifts. But if we ask you today, you have a justification, you normalize deviance, and society is in shambles. It's high time that we prioritize strategic change because we are faced with chronic and uh, persistent problems that are rooted in human behavior. And behavioral based issues cannot be easily resolved. And it doesn't take one person. But our youth today are made to believe that there is only one person who can solve their problems, the CEO or the apex leader. Our youth today are made to believe that there is a formula for you to, to develop yourself. And they ignore the effective use of self. So we need strategic change to happen in our society. And there's need paradigm shifts that are fundamental to move our organizations forward. And I have five paradigm shifts that I will quickly run through 
as I only have 10 minutes left. Five paradigm shifts that we need to see in our leaders. And the first is effective use of self. If you effectively use yourself, you will achieve the impossible. And effective use of self has different dimensions, which we will not be able to cover because of the limitations of time. Number two, we need to move away from the VUCA of uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity to start working from a position of vision, a position of understanding, a position of clarity, and a position of agility in our organizations. It's high time that our leaders stop much talk about volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, and use these to justify inconsistencies in their implementation. We need leaders who have vision and acuity of vision. We need leaders who have understanding, leaders who have clarity of the marketplace, leaders who are agile. And this is the time to shift our mindset from that problem-based orientation to possibility seeking and start moving our organizations forward. Here's a question. I will not be able to discuss this in detail. And this question was posed by Zand in 2010, and he said, does men exist for the benefit of organizations such as industry, the state, or the market? Or do organizations exist for the benefit of men? If you look at our organizations, if we look at our models of leadership in organizations, men exist for the benefit of organizations. So much such that, we see someone going to work every day, 365 days a year from nine to five, and you meet this person at the end of the year, they have achieved nothing. Men are being used for the benefit of organizations. And organizations are owned by only a few at the expense of everyone else. So we need to see organizations supporting men and we need to see leaders having that understanding that organizations exist for the benefit of men. It could be customers, it could be suppliers, it could be employees. They have to benefit from the organization. And the field of 4D brings some of these fundamental values, social values, democratic values, and the humanitarian values that are essential for us to lead sustainable change, sustainable strategic change in organizations. The field of organization development, blending it with essential leadership, brings change in organizations, a shift in our mindset as leaders towards fact-based decision-making, towards unifying people, towards seeing leaders who want to see their subordinates growing year in, year out. Leaders who want their employees to do more than they are doing themselves. This comes with collaboration. This comes with employee engagement. This comes with having a positive regard for employees and re-looking or revisiting our ways of leadership and moving away from motivational speaking types of leadership. Robert Marshak raised a question and he said, it is a call for all those in OD and those in leadership to expand their issues of concern beyond economic viability and quality of work life, to start to include issues of social justice, sustainability, global health, climate change, and so forth. So those of us who are involved in the CEO roundtables, directors meetings, should move away from the exclusive focus on economic viability to start including issues of social justice, real sustainability, global health, climate change, and addressing the is issues of poverty in our society. And this will not happen overnight. And we also need to have a paradigm shift from problem solving to appreciative inquiry. In most organizations, when we look at an issue, we go through problem identification, analysis of causes, analysis of possible solutions, and action planning. And what we need to start seeing from an OD perspective, evaluating what is best, 
envisioning, creating dialogue, and innovating. And this was the discussion that was covered yesterday by Professor Nana when she was talking about creativity and the need to envision. But our organizations spend more time on root cause analysis and analysis of uh, possible solutions, and they ignore what's working. They ignore what might be, what should be, and what will be. And eventually we keep on complaining year in, year out. It's high time we change our mindsets as leaders and change the mindsets of those around us to appreciative inquiry. We need also to see paradigm shift in terms of the structures of organizations, shifts in terms of the systems and processes, shifts in terms of the behavioral science knowledge in organizations, and start ensuring that we use evidence-based methodologies to address these issues from both a diagnostic perspective and a dialogic perspective in our organizations. Most organizations suffer from the TFW virus, which is the Taylorism, Fiolism, and Weberism virus. For those who studied management, understand the scientific management principles, Weber's principles and the 14 principles of Fiol. It's unfortunate that those principles which were established in the 1914s to 1930s are still dominating in our organizations today. Yet we speak in conferences that change is the new constant. It's high time that our organizations change. The last paradigm is shift from underperforming cultures to high performing cultures. In most organizations, we see predatory cultures. We see frozen cultures. There's a dominance of chaotic cultures and political cultures where people are having this internal joking for TEF, internal joking for positions, internal joking for recognition. They want the CEO to appreciate to see me and they should not see the other employees. We have bureaucratic cultures in organizations. There's need for a shift to service cultures and shift to new age cultures. As I learned, we need to have an understanding of the driving forces and the restraining forces in our organizations. We need to have a broader perspective of change in organizations. And this requires us to look at issues from an individual perspective, a group perspective, and total system perspective. We also need to have diagnostic and dialogic methodologies and the blending of the two in order to ensure we derive sustainable value. We need to ensure our organizations are continuously learning and we can't do away with the behavioral science knowledge, which brings in humanistic, social and democratic values in organizations. And these have to be embraced in total and organizations have to commit to these values. Does the language of humanitarian so social and uh, democratic values have relevance in Africa today in the face of the converging forces? I believe yes. If our leaders start embracing humanitarianism, it helps us to move forward as a society. And this is something that is covered in the Ubuntu philosophy in Africa, which is talked about, but the implementation of it has a lot of questionable issues. My last slide for today, we need interventions that positively sustain strategic change. As leaders, we need to encourage relentless exploration and exploitation, which is the building of ambidexterity competencies in organizations. We need to enhance training and development models. We need to facilitate social networking, cultivate cultures of empowerment, build talented organizations, insist on excellence, and empower all employees. This can move our organizations forward. I thank you so much for listening and back to you, Madam Genevieve. Apologies for making this a lecture. Wow, 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 wow. I must say I have truly enjoyed the session and I have learned a lot. It's real food for thought for me, real food for thought because uh, most times we don't want to listen to deep talks like this, but these are true talks. And Dr. Justine, in fact, I must say, it was a great delivery. Thank you so much.
and I have seen a lot of comments already, interesting views, very informative. Thank you so much, Dr. Justine. This is holistic. I mean, the comments just keep coming and it is so true. One thing that it's a take out for me is that we should be engaging as leaders. It shouldn't just be about looking at the top leaders and enjoying all the goodies that comes with it, but we should be very engaging with our team members. We should form an agile environment. We should be leaders who are people who are interested in getting our team members or our employees to be well equipped in terms of continuous development. Thank you so much, Dr. Justine. Thank you so much. Now the floor is open for questions, comments, contributions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll bring the first question from our social media platform um, because right. I realized that yesterday, yesterday we couldn't match, we couldn't do much from the social media platform. So today, let me start with the first question from the social media platform, and uh, okay. we also have with us Dr. Daniel Hazel. Dr. Daniel Hazel, Hazel, kindly also listen to this question as well, as we will also take your, your response also on it. The question is, how do we ensure steady financing for our significant needs for sustainable development in an uncertainly, in an increasingly uncertain global environment? That, this is a question from a participant. How do we ensure steady financing for our significant needs for sustainable development in an increasingly uncertain global environment. Thank you. Uh, I'll give a brief response to that in terms of uh, meeting the financial needs in an environment that is uh, uncertain, an environment that is volatile. And this brings us back to the issue of uh, inquiry and engagement and strategic planning. Organizations have a different network of stakeholders that they interact with. And in this network, the strategic planning aspect should point an organization towards the different sources of financing that are there and the source that can ensure that sustainability in the company's operations. So we have different sources of finance that are available to an organization. And most of these organizations are not open to each organization because there are certain requirements that have to be fulfilled. If you go to the bank, they have their requirements. And an organization might not meet these specific requirements. But how do we open up numerous sources of financing and ensure that sustainability agenda? And this is something that most organizations are battling with, the issue of finance and how to ensure the continuous uh, operations of an organization. So we need to engage our stakeholders. We need to do inquiry and depth of inquiry in terms of engagement with these different stakeholders and seeing the different sources that are available to an organization. There is no one size fits all source of finance for organizations. That's my take on that. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you. Please, would anyone want to contribute to what Doc said, or we can move to the next question? Okay, I saw a hand up. Chide. Chide, please, can you let us have your question? Okay. Dr. Saibedi, I could please, if you have any questions, you can. Well, okay, there, there was another question, but I think that was also not directly related to what we are doing. The person wanted okay. to find out um, what kind of human uh, capital do we need uh, for an appeal development? I think that's the question he was asking. He was just asking for the kind of human capital do we need as, um, as Africa when it has to do with uh, 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 the development, uh, uh, is there an underpinning development? I bring, okay. I come back to the issue of uh, contextual intelligence. And yesterday, I think Mr. Tabani raised that issue when he spoke about curriculum development and said what we are teaching in our universities in most instances is not relevant to the African context. So if we can revisit our curriculum and develop <clears throat> a curriculum that is specific 
to the African issues. So the issue of uh, appreciative intelligence and contextual intelligence should be prioritized in our organizations. And how do we do that? We need to integrate theory, practice, and experience in our organizations. And this goes back for those who are involved in studying and reading. If we look at the Aristotelian second legacy, the Aristotelian second legacy indicates the need to integrate theory, practice, and experience. So there is no an African kind of human capital, but there is human capital that is embedded in theory, in practice, and in experience. But what we see most in organizations are graduates who have pieces of paper from universities. And universities have that pride to say we have issued 5,000 degrees in the year 2019. And when you engage in conversations with these graduates, it's shameful that most of them have no clue of the basics of economics, yet they are holding an economics degree. They have no clue about banking theory, yet they have a banking qualification. Most of the graduates we see at master's level, I did an interview here in Abu Dhabi for, with one African candidate, and after the meeting, I told him, do not do embarrass the African continent by coming to an interview and you have a master's in banking and finance, and I ask you a basic question about banking, and you tell me I have done banking and finance five years ago, so I have forgotten. I told him, go back home to Africa, then embarrass the African continent. So African education systems need to ensure that when we are giving people pieces of paper we call certificates and degrees, people have value in these papers. Those who are here who do interviews can attest to that. Most of the graduates we see in interviews are as good as grade seven, taking them back to grade seven, yet they have master's degrees. And I had that audacity to tell this guy after the interview, go back home and don't waste time and embarrass Africa here. We need to give due respect to education and ensure education is given the pride of place rather than being in this wave of selling certificates and giving certificates when people can't do anything with that. So there is no in African education, there is no in African type of employee. We need employees who are practical and who can apply what they learn. Thank you so much, Dr. Justine. I have an no, interesting comment. Can I please um, go ahead? I wanted to read a comment from Ezekiel Odeyemi. He says, thank you very much, Dr. Justine. We live in a toxic environment where both the leaders and the led operate with crab mentality. And I think it's so true. It, it, it's so true. Another one says that this was a great presentation, Dr. Justine. God bless you. This was very informative, Dr. Justine. God bless you. I have a question. It says, I love mentoring and leading, but many young engineers around me are just after money rather than professionalism and i'm at 40 yet no young engineer to rely on what can i do all right uh, i think there's another question from daniel then i think we can close and move to the next speaker okay right sure. uh, good morning everyone uh, please dr justin that was a very wonderful presentation uh, i have some few take takeaways I took notice of uh, a linkage between a question you asked in your presentation, which was about, does man live for an organization or does organization live for man? Now, uh, I was linking that to another very important approach you mentioned, which is being appreciative and then adopting appreciative and an inquiry approach to, 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 to the solutions that we offer as an organization instead of focusing more on what is not working and then pushing so much energy into trying to come out of the problem solving approaches. Now, my point is that if we are able to adopt this appreciative and inquiry approach to problem solving, then it means that organization indeed will be living for man. Why? Because every organization basically has a mandate of trying to solve a problem in society. 
So by virtue of focusing on this aspect, on what is working and improving it, it means that organization will now go a long way to rather be living for man. In other words, solving the basic problems of society. So I'm very grateful for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'll start from the issue of an engineer who wants to be doing uh, mentorship, yet the youths now they are after money. This is an issue that needs us to reorient the youths today. Why this is happening is we have a lot of uh, overnight entrepreneurship trainers who are coming into the marketplace and are telling the youths that you have to be an entrepreneur. But if you go to the basics of economics, those who study economics, I have the basics of it. I just did it at basic level. We have the four factors of production. And the four factors of production include land, labor, capital, and uh, entrepreneurship. And the fly-by-night entrepreneurship trainers tell youths that you need to start your own business. Rather than telling youths about the significance of working and working with a mindset of an entrepreneur. So as an engineer, you want to train and mentor people. We should not go through the social approval lane where you want to have 50 people around you and train, like what the guys, other guys are doing on social media. They put people together, 40 people together, they do training, they post on social media, and it's like they are doing something meaningful. For me, myself, those who are under my mentorship know I work with three, two, or five people. I don't take pride in having a hundred people in a room because this has led us to failure where people are just looking after fame and not real transformation. So you look for three people who are serious about engineering, you work with those three, you realize that the value that you derive will outlive you. Where, rather than getting people in a room, taking pictures and posting on social media that today I had a training session with 50 people. And what did the 50 people do after, at the end of the day? There is nothing. So work with very few people who are serious about development. Don't pride yourself in getting a number of people under you. It has not paid anything in Africa. But those who work, I have few people under me. I don't pride myself. I don't even call myself a leadership expert, a leadership development trainer, an international coach, and all these things, that titles that people are giving themselves. I just work with one or two people who are serious about development, and we achieve more than having 100 people in a room. Thank you, Thank you so much.